All right, what's up, Defenders of Hogwarts? This is Stephen, Nathan, and Dan with Phantology's final review of Harry Potter, at least in this format. So we've done reviews for the first six books plus part one, book seven, part one, and now we're on to book seven, part two. And so last time we cut off after Dobby tragically died uh, in, in the Deathly Hollows, and now we're going to talk through the rest of the book. So uh, Nathan, Dan, you guys are excited. I mean, is this kind of sad here? Like this is our last Harry Potter? There are a lot of mixed feelings for me. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I, I, I mean, it's a little sad for sure. I want to note that at the time of recording, our podcast for part one has not yet come out. So if I contradict something directly that I said in part one, it's not my fault because I don't remember everything I said in that. Yeah, still, uh, still working on the release for that. I think we can expect that out very soon. But it is a little tricky sometimes between release and recording. We don't really know exactly when that's going to be. But if you like our Harry Potter content and you want to hear more, we need to figure out what we're going to do from here on out. We could do some tier lists. We could do, I don't know, just like deep dives into the lore of Harry Potter, anything like that. So, so uh, shoot us some comments or let us know in Discord how we can continue to cover Harry Potter because it's fun and it seems like the legacy of Harry Potter will never die. I have a lot of ideas for that. I had the idea of doing a Harry Potter trivia podcast where one of us picks different questions and pits the other two against each other to see who knows the most. Or just like general hot takes are always fun. We put a lot of them in the individual episodes, but we could do an all-encompassing hot takes kind of podcast. I like Just some ideas. Yeah, yeah. 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 I like those, those ideas. ideas. Okay. Yeah, if you're listening, let us know uh, if you have any ideas and if you like phantology you can find more at www.phantologybooks.com and you, and you can support the show at patreon.com slash phantology underscore books so are we ready to get rolling with part two i think we need our customary kind oh. of cheesy joke from dan right <laughs> i don't have a cheesy joke yet but steven how do i get invited to the fantasy book rave that you're at right now yeah uh the, the new year is ushering in a new quality of phantology and uh and you can see that if you're watching on youtube the new uh background that i've got set up here so just showing off you know the currently uh the book we're currently reviewing what i'm currently reading and a bunch of other books and posters etc so uh yeah it's, it's a fun time here at phantology <laughs> there's so much to look at for viewers that haven't checked us out on youtube this one is worth a listen now that steven has his fresh background yeah, so is this the first one with your new background? No, episode 100. Shout out Phantology, 100 episodes. The yeah, big premiere. Yeah, episode 100 that came out at the time of recording came out today, had the new background, but the lighting was all messed up. It still may tinker with the lighting a little bit more. Anyway, um, yeah, there, there's a fun background and I may pivot my entire career to being a booktuber. Uh, we'll see what happens there. I, I spy hundreds of dollars worth of books right behind you it's a very impressive setup yeah yeah the just top uh, it off. just hundreds that's all <laughs> yeah. uh-huh yeah <laughs> okay part two so yeah, dobby, harry potter let's go yeah harry potter here we go so dobby has died he saved everyone at malfoy manor and now we pick up from there and what we've been doing is just talking through the characters i think last time we started with harry i think we got to do harry as well because talking about harry just kind of like naturally takes us through the plot and then we can fill in all the other gaps when we talk about other characters. So let's talk about Harry. So one of the first things that happens is he digs Dobby's grave by hand. And then he has kind of this realization moment where he, he decides he's going to go after the Horcruxes and trust Dumbledore and not waste his time with the Hollows, even though that's kind of an alluring, powerful thing. So this is kind of like a, a big pivot point for the book where now, you know, the, the big action is about to start. And Harry's made this decision. Yeah, and I I really like this part because it just he just goes right in. He talks with Grimhook um, about the sword, and then Mister Ollivander about the wands, and kind of that kind of alludes to. And Harry gets more of an understanding about like the wands trust and how that all works, and then they just go right at it at Gringotts. Um, yeah, how do we feel about the wand, the wand lore aspect that's kind of thrust onto us in the second part? I've heard a lot of critiques about how it should have been more introduced gradually. What did you guys think about that? 
the whole thing of like if you take over someone else's wand then there's the, the allegiance is to you now and that was how the elder wand was passed on that that whole thing is what you're talking about i feel like yeah that's what i'm talking about i feel like the only real introduction we had to this before was the whole idea of the wand chooses the wizard but it makes it feel like the wand is so much more sentient than that because you get the moment where Harry's wand acts on its own accord and attacks Voldemort. And then you get this whole stuff about winning other people's wands. I do wish that we would have heard about it, at least in the latter half of the series, like maybe in books four, five, six, just a little bit more. I guess it just never happened before where someone was actually stealing a wand and then using it. I mean, we obviously had Expelliarmus was a big thing since the dueling club back in book two and you think maybe that yeah. could have been mentioned like oh by the way when you do this you're now winning the allegiance over if you keep the wand uh, yeah something like that yeah. but it, it seems like maybe something that jk rowling hadn't really figured out until this book dueling class. club would have been a now. perfect place and because yeah you have all these situations what if a student can make excuses why they botched an exam or something why they weren't able to transfigure something or do a charm because, oh, shoot, I think my my wand, I, I think I lost the allegiance <laughs> to my wand in the last yeah, week. Yeah, but if you have I think the dueling Harry club, then, you, <laughs> then like the, they would all have to get new wands at the end of the year if they lost their allegiance. Yeah, I mean, it's Ron one of those things. Ron would have to get a new wand, wand every year. Yeah, <laughs> Ron would always need a new wand because he's his allegiance is always going over to some Slytherin that disarms him or something, but... Uh, it seems like it's one of those things where J.K. Rowling is bringing in these, this idea for this book, and it's important, but it's not really called upon in other books, a la The Time Turner, for example. It's something uh -huh. she does. It's part of the Harry Potter formula. So I guess we just excuse it. But yeah, there are like some continuity and plot holes in the entire series if you want to really get into it. So Nathan, Griphook. So Griphook, the, mm -hmm. the goblin, and yeah. the, whole, the whole Gringotts thing. So after they get the wand intel that, you know, they hang out at Shell Cottage for a little bit, they plan it out, and then now they're off to Gringotts. And it kind of built up this, this uh, thing between Harry and Griphook, where it seemed like Harry was going to trick him and not really give him the sword. But at the same time, Bill is like, hey, don't double cross a goblin. Um, for me, this was just kind of like a minor thing that didn't really mean anything by the end because they were able to kill the Horcrux in another way, but I guess it kind of like created some tension here uh, yeah, during, well, during the, the whole moment, heist part. Yeah, in the moment for sure, because they didn't know like the whole idea later in, later in the book where Ron gets the idea to go to the Chamber of Secrets, right, and get the Basilisk right. thing. That didn't, I mean... Didn't wouldn't it, wouldn't have later. been needed. Yeah, wouldn't, yeah, have been wouldn't needed be needed if they had the sword. sword for yeah. sure. Also, something to go back the the crucial moment where uh, Lupin comes and uh, tells everyone that they had the kid, Teddy. Yeah, yeah, they've got they've got a child Nathan, now. We're talking Teddy's about Griphook right now, Nathan. <laughs> yeah, but that happens while they're at Shell Cottage. But we're not going in chronological order. We're bouncing around. Yeah, but yeah. I just thought that I'd bring that up before. He... No, it's a very touching moment. Contrasted with the previous Lupin moment where he comes in and says like, hey, never should have, you know, had a kid with Tonks. This was all a big mistake. So if I, I Lupin's redeemed himself a little bit, I guess. And you have all of the parallels that I'm sure you guys know about between this book and then the Sorcerer's Stone and the Godfather status being part of that and Ted Tonks being a, or little Ted Tonks being Teddy. Mm -hmm. A big yeah. part of that parallel. Teddy Lupin. Like he kind of has the, the parallel to Harry himself as when the, when the series started. Right. And he's orphaned. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Harry isn't thrown into Azkaban for. So I guess, you know, the whole thing with the, with the sword. Yeah. <laughs> Harry. Well, not yet. Harry, 19 years later, Harry's not in Azkaban, but I guess the whole thing with the sword is, is part of what we call like the tri fail cycle when you know, when uh, authors write books where they have the characters go through these sequences of like we're going to try this thing it's not going to work out but it moves the plot along kind of two steps forward one step back a bit and so they lose the sword but that leads them to go into the chamber of secrets and get the the basilisk fang and, and so it just kind of moves you know things along a bit uh we nice. can't always win everything so that's I love the happen. part of the 
I love the part of the podcast when Stephen educates us on literary themes and ideas. Yeah, uh, credit Brandon Sanderson writing lectures. <laughs> also, so th- um, yeah, I, I just want to know what your guys' thoughts on Harry and I think Ron might have the them using the Imperial Curse on one of the goblins. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so I have some thoughts about their use of unforgivable curses in general. You've had that thought before when Harry cast the Cruciatus on Bellatrix in his rage. Back back in book five, yeah. Yeah, So now that they're older, I mean, they gotta understand more. But now it's okay. Like, they're called the unforgivable curses. They were introduced as, if you use these things, you will go to Azkaban for life, right? That was how it was introduced in the fourth book. I think yeah. the Imperious Curse has by far the biggest variance because you can use the Imperious Curse and just do pranks kind of, uh, or you can use it to commit very, very serious uh, egregious acts. But the Cruciatus, Cruciatus Curse and Avada Kedavra, I think are a tier ahead of the Imperial Curse. Yeah, so Hermione busts out the Imperious Curse. I mean, look, I mean, it, it was kind of necessary for their plan a little bit but it just seems like they're crossing these lines like when when a hero crosses these lines of good and evil that's fine you know sometimes that's that's part of the struggle that they go through but typically there's some punishment or there's something that happens as a result and they never have any backlash from using the unforgivable curses they are forgiven i guess it, it doesn't make sense yeah well we it's only change. those three people that know well, not really, because when uh, when Harry pops out to defend McGonagall from Amicus the, Caro, yeah, right? he he just he uses Crucio right away in front of everyone. In front That's of the everyone one where it's, it's least necessary. <laughs> yeah, yeah I don't, maybe I don't that's know about the that time one. to use Stupefy. Stupefy still in the arsenal. Expelliarmus. Expelliarmus. Yeah, Crucio. <laughs> I mean, what what is this? <laughs> He was just avenging all of his Dumbledore's army peeps that had gotten done telling him how they were suffering at the hands of the Carols the whole year. So he was coming out red hot when he saw this guy and he had had previous interactions with him. I'm not, I mean, I'm just trying to justify it a little bit, but I agree that other spells should have and could have been used. Yeah. Harry is supposed to represent, you know, Harry and the Gryffindors are supposed to kind of represent like this restraint from using the evil Slytherin magic right using using the dark magic and it's like if luke skywalker was all of a sudden blasting off sith powers and then he's like oh actually i'm i'm still going to be a jedi like i'm I'm not really going to go the dark side i'm just going to use their spells every now and then that that wouldn't make sense yeah but steven i i very listened to a podcast recently where they you guys talked about the gray jedi and the balance in between the force if you're going to mention star wars and that's okay. what harry could have been in this moment in between the light and the dark to accomplish what was needed to be done yeah but he never he doesn't stay there he just he just uses these things unnecessarily crucio specifically uses them unnecessarily and then ends up being good at the end when he's like oh i don't need the hollows and you know i'm i'm gonna become a or and live out my life in righteousness and it, 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 there should be some backlash for these sins that he's committing, right? Actually, yeah. Stephen, I'm going against you. I'm not taking the high ground on this. They're in the middle of a war. And I do like how, even though, yeah, they're Gryffindors, they're supposed to be the model of nobility, or I don't even know if nobleness is necessarily Gryffindor attribute. It's mostly courage. It's but like brave courage. Yeah, bravery. They, it, war times call for this, and especially when Harry's been provoked and attacked to, at the level and degree which he has then i'm i'm willing to overlook it and i i like how not all the gryffindors how even when you're sorted into a house you do have some different uh character attributes except for slytherin slytherins are all bad i mean i'm willing to say that yeah i realize especially with the imperious curse that it was necessary perhaps for what they were trying to accomplish however these things are called unforgivable curses there should be some punishment. There should be something bad that happens because they've done this. So you're saying they should have some kind of trace like they do for underage wizards to track who's using the unfor- unforgivable curses? Something like that. Or, or because Harry has used these evil, these dark arts too much, 
maybe you know maybe the uh the, the magic that his mother imparted doesn't work as well and that the power of love has been diluted because harry is calling upon the forces of evil to get done what he's trying to do like there, there should be something that happens magically yeah i don't know it, it could have been done and, and i guess you know that makes it hard for the plot she was trying to fit in but it doesn't quite make sense to me I don't know. I mean, all throughout the books, Harry's go-to spells expel Yarmus, right? He uses Superfy a little bit here and there. But, I mean, all throughout the whole series, you want Harry to use more than just one spell. Yeah, but why doesn't, so we, he, know, why doesn't he know something that is powerful but not unforgivable? Like some kind of blasting spell or like some supercharged Expelliarmus or you know, something that's not as weak as Expelliarmus but not as unforgivable as the torture spell. I don't know. I felt like he just wanted to get the job done. I I liked I liked that. I mean, what I mean, if you want to have some sort of punishment for him, you gonna throw Harry into Azkaban or something? Take away his wand? I mean, absolutely. He's he's done something that's unforgivable. All right, I think we're beating a dead horse at this point. <laughs> but I stand yeah. I stand by my argument. So uh, let us know what you think on Discord on this one because it's something I've always kind of had an issue with. Anyway, the whole Gringotts part. Was the heist here cool? Yeah, it was way cool. Big yeah, fan of the sure. heist. I did want to talk about the grip hook and goblin thing more. So that wasn't doing much for you guys, learning about the wizard goblin relations. It was okay. I mean, it's been something that's been discussed before with Umbridge and the half breeds and everything. I was wondering, is it. Uh, in full full disclosure, I'm not super familiar with Lord of the Rings besides the movies. Um, I haven't read them in a really long time. But how similar are the goblin relations to those in Lord of the Rings? Because I know, like, is that borrowed at all? Is that, like, are goblins always the people that make weapons and things and feel slighted by the humans? Is that always what the dynamic is? Uh, I would say it's more in dwarves, uh, yeah, typically. Dwarves. Dwarves are, are kind of your forgers of, of weapons. Yeah. Goblins, <laughs> yeah, that's, goblins, not as much like in Lord of the Rings. They're, you know, the ugly. That's totally what, that's that totally what I'm thinking. Mud. I'm just yeah. thinking of Gimli right now. <laughs> okay. Gim, Gimli, not a goblin, even though it would be a nice. No, I, yeah. He's a dwarf. All right. Thanks for correcting me guys. Yeah. The, the goblins here are more kind of your gray character race here where they're like, work with the wizards but they're willing you know they've got their own set of laws and uh, the goblins lord of the rings are just evil and that's something that i liked because we're fighting this war of good versus evil the death eaters versus everyone else but even if you know what side of the war you're fighting on it doesn't necessarily mean that you're 100 good or that you're even 100 aligned with uh, the people that you're fighting alongside because I like that dynamic of Grip Hook is he's basically fighting against Voldemort because he thinks it'll be best for, I guess, the goblin race in general. And But he still keeps his best interests. Um, that's, he acts in accordance with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, he just wants the sword because the goblins made the sword. So right. he thinks it belongs to the goblins. Right. It's always fun when you have characters with different... Uh, motivations and in conflicts it you know brings together people who are like oh i can see it from their angle but also from my hero's angle so it's you know it makes sense the grip hook would want the sword and and you can kind of cheer for him a little bit to get it back i don't know like he seems like a decent guy yeah i don't remember being devastated when they lost the sword but rather i was just so relieved that they made it out of that that c duplicating mm -hmm. cup that murder trap that thing yeah, sounds that was, so scary. That was kind of a fun idea, right? <laughs> yeah, imagine the Lestranges next time they open up their vault. Well, I guess I already know it's been broken into and they can't access anything because it's just filled with the cups. <laughs> well, there's got to be like a like a charm or like a spell or something like that that stops that. They must be... The, yeah, they must not be permanent, right? Otherwise, you could just duplicate your money or duplicate any valuable object and that, that would kind of break the economy. I'm guessing but, it's kind of like the galleons that Fred and George lost at the end of the Triwizard, uh, uh -huh. not the Triwizard, at the end of the uh, Quidditch World Cup. 
Um, but yeah, I did think that this part was really cool. And especially at the end when they escape on the dragon, because the description of the dragon, uh, you feel really bad for it because it's obviously been mistreated and abused. And so they have a double win. They get the they get the exciting escape, but they also get to save this awesome creature and break through. So it's a very satisfying um, series of events. Oh yeah, and there you've is, always you've always wanted to see someone ride a dragon in in the series. Never happened before. There is a major plot hole because they just fly over London like with the dragon and yeah. <laughs> Maybe maybe it's a cloudy day. London always is a lot of cloud cover, right? <laughs> I learned I mean, yesterday basically... that I learned yesterday that Wonder Woman can make an entire airplane disappear. So somehow, actually, no, it, it's not. It's not. Uh, they they didn't use any spells, so this comparison doesn't work. Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't. The the dragon's fun, I guess. Yeah, maybe someone saw it, but at the same time, there's a lot of magical happenings happening right now so i the dragon is maybe like the yeah. least of anyone's worries and something i noticed and it was especially noticeable in the second half of the deathly hollows is jk rowling's really good about giving you this surge of action and it's immediately followed by this recovery where we take a step back and it's kind of low key for a few pages or yeah. like half of a chapter and it's, it establishes a really nice rhythm because we always get a chance to catch our breath when something happens. Like right after the dragon took the trio and took them to safety, then they have the lake scene, which is really chill. And even later in the book, like when Harry dies and he faces Voldemort, then he gets that, we get to catch our breath when he talks to Dumbledore. And when the war is going on, I noticed it on a more micro sense, like you'd have some really violent stuff happening. Like I'm trying to think, like when Fenrir Greyback is straight up ripping lavender brown apart like Juan Juan is dying and brutally being murdered and then right after that professor trelawney like drops a crystal ball on his head which is clearly supposed to be for a comedic effect and to lighten the mood a little bit so she does a really good job of that yeah and, and also you know when Voldemort gives them the hour to recover everyone and then Harry's got to go back and and he, he listens to the or he uh, jumps into the pensive gets snape's information yeah there, there's a lot of examples of that that's true her pacing is really good so after the lake thing they jump off the dragon into the lake probably a pretty scary jump but they do it um and then they they make their way into hogsmaid and then from there they go into hogwarts itself and they meet up with our friends that we haven't seen for most of the book, right? All of our Hogwarts yeah. buddies, uh -huh. Neville and the rest of the DA. And now Harry's recruited everyone to search for this diadem. And it's all happening super fast now. Like we're just a break, breakneck pace. Well, I mean, like Dan said, there are some things that kind of slow it down, but for the most part, like the battle of Hogwarts, the final conclusion is now happening. And it starts here with the yeah. diadem search. And was it we like, too convenient how quickly they found the diadem like uh, I, I don't know i don't think so i mean it kind of was because harry had to go talk to the gray lady and find out kind of what happened like the history behind it almost okay and then so there are a few steps to it still yeah and then he had to find out that it was in the rumor requirement uh, but at the same time i mean ron and hermione went into the chamber of secrets yeah yeah there's a lot happening i guess it was kind of convenient how as soon as he described it luna's like oh you're talking about the diadem mm -hmm. yeah i know exactly mm -hmm. what that is so. <laughs> i know where to go <laughs> yeah well the horcruxes in general should have the problem that i have is them being in the room of requirement they could have i think i i had this take on the first half but didn't i say he could have just buried it in the ground somewhere and it would have been undetectable yeah. we talked about that but, a little bit yeah so that's the biggest problem that I have, but they obviously need to find it really quick. It does seem like the whole first half of Deathly Hallows, they're finding one Horcrux, and then it takes them a while to figure out how to destroy it. And then it's like rapid fire, all the rest of them happen. They just, they just had to build up some momentum, find their yeah. stride. Yeah, difficulty for the locket was like 10 out of 10, and these other ones are just falling out yeah no problem well because they're in hogwarts and that's where voldemort can't get to right yeah was it a i mean was it a major uh major oversight or a major mistake on voldemort's part 
to continually allow Harry to see what was going on and realize that Voldemort, like his positioning was given away and his knowledge of the Horcruxes, like how does Voldemort allow this to happen? He's just unaware. Well, he's dying. Voldemort's slowly dying. He's slowly losing power. No, it uh, mentions I that. I don't think, I mean, didn't we talk about this? Like the, the Horcrux destruction, does that actually decrease his power? I didn't really see that. Well, I would think so. That or just not his power per se, but he is dying. When you kill a part a Horcrux, you're killing a part of his soul. He doesn't seem to be weakened on the battlefield. Yeah. I don't know if I well, see he that. He isn't on the battlefield. Only only at the end. But like before Harry sacrificed himself, you don't see him until Yeah, he but he's me. not like his eyes aren't bloodshot he's not like coming apart at the seams like our villain in wonder woman oh good yeah, second wonder woman reference oh. yeah. <laughs> if you haven't seen wonder woman yet uh well, let's not do spoilers but uh the villain there is you know, a little unhinged um but so so Voldemort doesn't have that happening he seems like he's you know, he's upset that the horcruxes are dying but he's not actively lessened yeah i think well, that he does send the car caros to go to um the common room of Hufflepuff. And of Ravenclaw. So kn- Raven- yeah, Ravenclaw. Yeah, well, he so, knows that they're being destroyed and he doesn't want it to happen, but the fact that they're being destroyed is not actively making him weaker. I would think so. Yeah, but why? Just I- because, like, we don't see that ever. I mean, yeah, I guess you would think so, but we don't ever see that. Well, no, but you, you got to think that it's, it's doing something to him. I get where the theory is coming from, but I don't think the book gives any indication of that. Like none of the Death Eaters are revering Voldemort. Any are there? Nobody's concerned for Voldemort, and maybe he's just doing a really good job of masking his power drain. But he he easily dispatches Snape. Mm-hmm. He I and mean, I mean, he's, think he's back still to, the most commanding presence. Think back to like the fifth book when he fights Dumbledore. He's already had one of his Horcruxes destroyed. You know, the, um, the the diary was destroyed back in the second book. He's able to fight Dumbledore just as strongly as, you know, it, it seems like Voldemort is back and he's super powerful and we're terrified of him. I don't think losing the Horcruxes has lessened him to any degree until finally when they all are killed off and he's now vulnerable to being killed. Yeah, it yeah. was convenient that Harry bought a lot of extra time because Voldemort was cruising around the countryside checking on the other Horcruxes. Like... The whole them being able to see into each other's minds was that Harry took power and control over that relationship. Like it was a two way street. Then it was all of a sudden just Harry Uh with the insight. And the, there is a small explanation in the book that that's because Voldemort doesn't understand love and it goes back to the love thing. But that's, that's what you would call plot armor, right? Steven? Yeah. Isn't that right? A little bit. Yeah. You're just like, (laughs) a little bit. Yeah. Um, Harry, Harry can now do this thing and it's because the plot needs it to happen like we need Harry to know where the Horcruxes are so uh, let's make it this connection that he's got with Voldemort yeah yeah he goes from totally bombing all of his oh gosh what's the what are the classes he takes with Snape the Occlumency. 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 yeah he goes from being the worst Occlumens ever to mastering the most powerful dark wizard in that yeah like, really little strange especially when hermione's like harry don't do it don't do it and do it. and then by the end he's like uh yeah uh wh- what's all pretty, saying what's he yeah. saying now <laughs> this is pretty critical to our well, success guys that's that's why i kind of think um that voldemort is slowly losing maybe not losing power but is dying just because he can't i mean earlier in this series right harry voldemort was looking to harry's mind and like making him do stuff and stuff like that and so that's why i think voldemort is either losing power or slowly dying because he can't control that as much uh i don't know it seems unclear i guess we agree to disagree on this one wait i have one last thought about that if that was the case nathan i like the idea because i'm not sold on the idea of love being the sole reason why that relationship flips but if Voldemort realized that his soul, that one seventh of his soul was destroyed by the diary. I think that when he gained more power, the first thing he would have done was gone and protected all the other Horcruxes so that he didn't lose any more. 
Well, he didn't think that anyone was going after the Horcruxes until book six. But yeah, then the he... diary died, but he knew the diary. I felt like the diary was like a sacrifice that he decided to use to get Harry early when he was only 12 years old. I don't know. I don't think the soul, the soul fragments are connected to their actual wizarding power. Like his soul fracturing has hurt him in other more basic human ways. I don't, I don't think it's necessarily his magical power, but uh, I think we're, we're once again beating a dead horse on this one. So <laughs> they, uh, they, they find the diadem finally in the room of requirement. And now we have our final showdown with Malfoy, Crab, and Goyle. And this is something that I liked quite a bit because this has always kind of been the conflict, the smaller conflict between Harry and Malfoy and his goons, Crab and Goyle. And now, once again, it happens, but this time the stakes are much higher. And it's fun that it's still happening. But yeah. And yeah. it seems like Crab is really feeling himself in the, the year of the Slytherin takeover of Hogwarts and the dark arts being taught. Like he's learned a lot of stuff and really come out of his shell. Like, wait, what was it? Was it last book? Oh yeah, it was it was book six when he was willing to um when he was willing to disguise himself as a little girl yeah to yeah exactly Malfoy. yeah and now he's trying to kill people yeah he summons the, the fiend fire i think is what it's called yeah yeah right fiend fire and it destroys everything in the room of requirement including the horcrux this is what we might call plot armor it's like oh we got to destroy this horcrux okay let's make this cool spell that's going to destroy a horcrux uh -huh. and let's have crab use it great problem solved <laughs> so yeah i don't know about that one but uh, it does yeah, I happen thought it, i thought it was a funny scene because they all i mean they right they get on brooms and they're flying around in the room of requirement, uh -huh. right and then they go back and save malfoy and the funny line of ron was like if we die i'm gonna kill you yeah <laughs> which yeah kind of helps kinda... harry later in the book yeah, and, and obviously being on brooms, like it's not you know, it, Quidditch and earlier in the book and almost back to like Sorcerer's Stone when they're capturing the the winged keys. And yeah, th there are quite a bit of similarities to previous books, which is fun. Yeah, I like when Harry gets to use his Quidditch skills. Um, you might remember in the very first uh, book podcast, I said that one of my takes was that Harry possibly has wasted goat level seeker skill to pursue these other uh huh. These other things, it does. Yeah, that sounds a little familiar. But hey, I mean, it seems like being an or and being a, a dark arts chaser, uh, the Quidditch skills transfer every now and then. That's right. Yeah. And this is funny as well because it's like the only thing that Hermione can't do very well, and the boys kind of have to save her here. Well, she gets on the broom herself. Yeah, but she's like not as good or something. Or I, I feel like I remember that. Uh, am I remembering this wrong? Well, she just doesn't like flying because they rescue Ron. Uh, Harry rescues Malfoy. He jumps on his broom, and Goyle jumps on uh, Ron's broom, and Hermione is just flying for herself. Okay. Yeah, I possibly remember that wrong, but. Uh... Yeah, okay, fun, fun scene. So let's move on to the battle itself, the, the larger battle. So this is happening in kind of stages, right? And sometimes our some of our friends are dropping, other times we have small victories, and it's all happening at Hogwarts. And I guess just overall, I think that it's perfect that the setting finally is back to Hogwarts and everything is now coming full circle and we're fighting to defend Hogwarts. It just makes it as the reader... You're much more connected to it because it's a setting that you love and are familiar with and it draws you in that much more because not only are we trying to save the world and stop Voldemort but we're trying to protect our home here that we're, we've been familiar with for years yeah and the suits of armor are coming to life everyone's pitching in we're using different plants to throw at death eaters yeah wasn't there a, were there mandrakes involved as mandrakes well? yeah, the, involved yeah mandrakes were involved <laughs> but yeah some people don't like how book seven doesn't take place at the school at all but i i don't have any problem with it because this is where the climax occurs and you knew it always had to come back to hogwarts mm -hmm. 
Yeah, maybe it's a little disappointing. There's no classes or tests and things that we like about Harry for some reason. You know, that's always kind of fun to have that school setting. But uh, we go away from that. But at the same time, we're like back enough to make it still be the same magic of Harry Potter. Yeah, I really like the Battle of Hogwarts. I like the book, um, the last part of the book, just because it, the battle is happening and you know what's happening around Hogwarts and you're getting introduced what's happening throughout the battle through like the Harry, Ron, Hermione's eyes, kind of, mm-hmm. even though you know what's happening and you find out later who dies, who survives, right? And it's so kind of it, it's kind of funny that they're not actually like participating all that much <laughs> they're they have this right. bigger mission every now and then they'll like blast off some spells to try to save as they run around and they've got this you get this sense that like everyone else is kind of fighting this futile battle and just have this faith that harry will somehow save the day it with some larger scheme yeah yeah for sure and I don't feel I, like too many pages needed to be devoted to those smaller side battles. Like there's not much that you can say about the wizard battle other than they landed their curse or they didn't and they're kind of dodging around. So I like that we we do have, obviously we have the Molly Bellatrix showdown. and But other than that, there's not, the battle isn't described, the actual fighting portion of it in great detail. Uh-huh. It almost feels like it's covered in greater detail in the Department of Mysteries at the end of book five than it is in the actual last battle. Yeah, because because our heroes have more things to do. And so once they finally, you know, they take care of their Horcruxes and the whole thing with Snape happens, we'll talk about that later. So Harry then realizes everything and he accepts that he needs to die. He tells Neville, hey, if you get a chance to kill the snake because that's important. Neville says, great, I'll do it. And then he heads off into the forest and he is now accepting that he, he's, he's got to die. He's got to sacrifice himself. And he opens up his snitch finally, pulls out the resurrection stone. Um, I guess before we go too much further, the, resur- the resurrection stone. My, I mean, am I wrong if I say, like, what's the point? Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I so like there, there should have just I been like two parts of the Deathly Hallows? What do you mean? There could have been three parts, but I don't see how the resurrection stone helps you. It just brings back ghosts that you can kind of that you can talk to for a short time like it helps them in no way it adds some emotional weight it adds some emotional weight but it doesn't actually assist him in any way i feel like it helps harry because yeah he knows he has to die but i mean if you're harry you gotta feel like you're still nervous about it you don't know what's gonna happen you don't even know if you're gonna come back i mean it adds to the theme of the his parents again yeah see serious And it adds to the theme of the book, uh, one of the themes of the book being that those who've died are still with us in part, and we can still call upon their memories, and you know they are very much a part of who we are. And so it's important and, and, and it's great in that way. It's beautiful in that way. But it doesn't help him like the invisibility cloak or the elder wand might help you. Um, no, so please. I'd always, you guys need to correct me on this. And it could be embarrassing that I'm asking this, but, but I've never known for sure. Is the, rex- the resurrection stone necessary for Harry being able to come back to life? I don't know. <laughs> no. The whole, it's like, he was, he was the master of the Deathly Hollows, Therefore, he was able to, that's why he came back to life. Right. So from the explanation that Dumbledore gave, I thought the reason why he survived the killing curse was because when Voldemort came back to life, he used Harry's blood Therefore, Voldemort couldn't kill Harry directly because Lily's Lily's Love. blessing, Lily's magic lived Love. in Voldemort, lived to kind of both of them. Therefore, it didn't Voldemort's curse didn't work. Okay. It's not, and listeners forgive me specifically for not knowing this for sure. It's probably a very common knowledge in the in the community, but uh, it doesn't really matter to me either way. I just wanted to see if there was a definitive answer. Yeah. Well, he I mean, kills when Voldemort uses the Vaticadabra on Harry. He kills his own soul. Right, he kills he kills the ugly little baby. That's yeah at King's Cross. Yeah, <laughs> that was um, when I was trying to think of a lead-in joke for the podcast. I wanted to base it around the little baby dying flesh ball, the little mm-hmm. helpless thing in the corner of the room. But I couldn't think of a joke about it. I, too, I steered clear. Too dark, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Okay, so Harry submits to death here. Now he doesn't fight back at all. He's killed. He goes off to King's Cross. So this is probably one of the more controversial parts of the book. Some people are like, this this whole thing was stupid. It's too, it's too meta, too metaphysical. It doesn't make sense to me. And I think it makes sense. I, th- I think it's you know kind of a fun way to make this whole plot work. What do you guys think? I don't think it, it, King's Cross, I don't think it should have been Dumbledore. Okay. Just, yeah, hit us I th- up. I think Wait, why, it should why? have been like... Serious? No, I think it should have been his mom. But that- isn't the whole like beginning part of the book, this conflict that Harry's trying to decide if Dumbledore really loves him or not, or if he ever trusted him. And then when he gets Snape's memory, he's like, wait, was Dumbledore just raising me to be killed eventually? And so I like yeah. that it was Dumbledore. I feel like it, it, brings a, been... it brings a great resolution to this whole thing. I don't know. I, I think it should have been Lily or both of his parents because right, he's talked to his parents once in Harry Potter 4 and then well, he Again. brings them into the Resurrection Stone, at least. They're, the they're resurrection. there a little bit. Yeah, he... Dumbledore is way more a part of his life than his parents are. Yeah, if he would have, if it would have popped up with his parents, he would have been awkward because he doesn't even know them. He would have yeah. had the yeah, but break who down. else? Who else is going to give you the last like motivation? Be like, yeah, you can do this. You can go and defeat Voldemort. Other than, I mean, it's got to be your parents. Yeah, but his parents don't have the same relationship that. I'm assuming you have with your parents because well, he no. doesn't know his parents at all. Like, like kind of like Dan said, I mean, I'm sure they could have, you know, talked him up a bit, but Dumbledore is way more of a parent figure than anyone else in his life. Plus Dumbledore actually knows what's going on and knows what he, information yeah. he needs to give to Harry. Dumbledore is the one. Yeah. Dumbledore is the only one uh, really who I knows. Know. I mean, he, Dumbledore just raised Harry to be killed at the end. But no, he didn't. That's that's kind of the point. Even though that was a part, well, that I mean, by just nature of circumstance, that happened. But that wasn't why. Like Dumbledore really did have a parental love for him and was raising him to ultimately win. He knew that he would have to die because that's that part of Voldemort was in him. But at the same time, he also knew that you know the powers of love and hope and all, all the goodness could prevail. Yeah, I don't know. I just felt like it would have been better for Harry to see his parents and be able to actually talk with them. I feel like you and I are disagreeing a lot in this episode. (laughs) This is great. Also, also, (laughs) just just to point out, Dumbledore, I felt like Dumbledore could have done a whole lot more. He had all three Deathly Hollows at one point. Why didn't Dumbledore just that well no that question else. that question was answered because of Dumbledore's backstory when him and Grindelwald one of them killed his sister right and ever since then be and that was a part of their search for the Deathly Hollows ever since then the guy's been scarred and doesn't want anything to do with it and so that's why he turned down any kind of positions with the ministry he always wanted to be uh, headmaster of Hogwarts and and have something that he he wouldn't be too tempted by the power because he knew he knew his potential he knew he'd be the greatest wizard ever he already pretty much was but also he was it's kind of like when when Gandalf um, turns down the 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 ring right because he knows how tempted he would be by that yeah, that's same, that's same type of comparison that's, I immediately thought of that I don't know I mean he goes because we find out I mean we do find out in the series that. Dumbledore is the one that had the invisibility cloak, right? The yeah. day, night that Harry's parents died. So yeah. He had that. He had the Elder Wand. And so why not either just have all three and just lock them up or, or something like that so no one could get them? I, just the whole thing with like the Elder Wand and how that eventually got to Harry uh, is just a little bit and how he didn't want to get to in Voldemort's hands. It's a little bit like... There's a huge plot hole. If he wanted Snape to be the master of the Elder Wands, he knew that Snape was eventually going to die from Voldemort, right? Because Voldemort thought that Snape. Yeah, was but he have didn't. It. I don't think it's a plot hole. He he recognized that that plan failed. He was trying to be buried with the Elder Wand, like he was hoping that Voldemort no, wouldn't but, find that out. But going back to like the Wand lore, right? That the wand well, I know chooses- that Snape was the master now. 
but Harry was hoping oh, Voldemort never Harry. figured that out. But that's Snape what Dumbledore was hoping. The master. It was Malfoy. Well, okay, sure. Yeah, th- there was that whole thing in there. So yeah, I-, I said that wrong. But I mean, my point stands. Dumbledore was just hoping that that was never figured out, and the wand died with it. But Stephen is a I huge mean, Dumbledore fan. No, I, the the whole I thing. Don't, I don't. Voldemort. I don't understand the. I don't understand the plot hole here. I think because, the, so the Deathly Hollows was explained what, really well with Dumbledore's backstory no, and everything. No, not that. Just the whole Voldemort, right? Trying to be like the evil Voldemort, right? Trying and he's trying to yeah, seek we know out the Elder Wand. Okay. And yeah. So, so Dumbledore Voldemort doesn't even this. know what the Deathly Hollows are, though. Voldemort doesn't understand the Deathly Hollows. No, he what? well, he kind of does. He knows who the Elder Wand is. Just the Elder Wand. Yeah. So Dumbledore, was, you got to think that Dumbledore knew about that or something like that from Snape. Well, if you're Dumbledore, what are you gonna do, knowing that you have to die? What's your like? That's a pretty good plan. Well, don't let Snape kill you and take the Elder Wand, where he knew that Voldemort could have access to it. Well, he gets buried with the Elder Wand. It's in his grave. He doesn't think Voldemort's gonna get to it. Well, anyone yeah, I see it. Grave. I see what both of you are saying. I have another question to interject, though. Why does he leave the Tales of Beetle and Bard with Hermione? After I never, I never fully understood that. Doesn't he? Like, he explains it a little bit. I think it's because oh, he, he wants to have Hermione kind of uh, reel in Harry a little bit. Like he wants to make sure Hermione understands. Is it because he wants to slow their pace in their Horcrux chase or something? No. It, you gotta I'm, think yeah. so that they can know what what the Deathly Hollows are. I mean, if you ask that question, Dan, the follow up question would be like, "Why are the Deathly Hollows in the book at all?" You know, like, yeah, what what, what, <laughs> what impact do they really have to the plot at large? Not that much. Like, it could be called Harry Potter and the Horcruxes. Well, I feel like it's a big part of Harry's character arc and his rejection well, he, of the Deathly Hollows pursuit. Yeah. And because so that's more of, that's more of a selfish thing. And as I was reading through it again, it didn't really make sense why he was doing that, knowing what he did about the Horcruxes. Because even if he did acquire all of the Deathly Hollows, basically the end result would have been a showdown between he and Voldemort over many years, and pretty much the entire Wizarding population would have probably been a casualty in this huge war, uh-huh. and it would have ended up like him and Vol- maybe eventually defeating Voldemort. But clearly the, the more noble route to what was best for the wizarding world was to go for the Horcruxes. Rather well, because than the at the, it explains it at the final battle between Ron and Harry, Harry and Voldemort. And Harry explains it to Voldemort that the wand doesn't belong to him. That the true master of the wand is Harry. And Harry well, yeah, no, we, we understand how the, the Horcruxes work, how the hollows work. I think that the question Dan is asking is like, how do they really fit into the plot at large? Like uh, if Harry had gone for the hollows instead of the Horcruxes. Well, because if the hollows weren't in there, then Voldemort would just have a regular wand. Yeah, but Harry didn't really need the other wand to beat Voldemort. By that point, the magic was on his side. He, I don't think he needed the other wand. Do you think he needed some wand trickery where Voldemort was accidentally using a wand that belonged to him? I I do think so. Because, yeah, that's a good point. They wouldn't have necessarily had to have been the Elder Wand. Because then Harry and Voldemort would have just fought, and you wouldn't have a clear winner. They would just go back and forth. Okay, the I'm reason gonna go... why Voldemort died is because the wand didn't belong to Voldemort, and it backfired on him and killed him. Uh, it didn't backfire. It was because... Because Harry didn't kill Voldemort. The wand... The wand that did well, belong to him backfired on Voldemort. And it didn't him. backfire. Their curses met in the middle. Their spells met in the middle, and Harry's won. Uh, and I assume that was because you know Harry had sacrificed himself, and basically all of the love magic was on his side. I'm for sure going to go back on Discord didn't later. To Harry, <laughs> the wand didn't belong to Voldemort. We may need a we may need so a Reddit we may need a Reddit deep him. dive on the actual. It could have been a yeah. combination of both. I mean, look, part of it was definitely the lily love magic that i've referenced part of it maybe the you know the wand lore that nathan's talking about with the elder wand maybe it was both things working out for him maybe it was just one or the other i don't really know to be honest i i don't know if that's definitively explained it just kind of all happens i'm gonna go back and check on discord because 
uh, I'm pretty sure we could be spreading a lot of fake news right now. And I'm not sure what the, is what. The love portion comes into when Voldemort tries to put a spell on all the Hogwarts people and and he puts this silencing charm on, on him and then he lights the sorting cat on fire uh-huh. and binds Neville and Neville breaks free. Sure. But I mean, also the, the fact the fact that he had the Elder Wand had nothing to do with Harry surviving being killed well no not that part yeah but just so, that whole so the, okay so there's parts for both with love yeah okay so yeah we'll, we'll have to maybe do some uh we have to do a correction on some of these things nathan may be right but uh what did we think of oh, okay so yeah. back to king's cross one, one more king's cross thing really quick okay did it really happen or was it just in his head because that's kind of the final line before he leaves right yeah, there's the famous line. I have it written down. Of course, it is happening in your head, but why does that mean it's not real? Uh huh. So, what's the interpretation? Did he does really it, see Dumbledore there? Do I have to care? I don't know. It, Dumbledore's yeah. always waxing poetic. He's always has to be deeply philosophical. Every other sentence. So, I, I guess my interpretation was. Uh, I don't think it did really happen. Like, I don't think he was really seeing a ghost of Dumbledore, but it was because of the imprint that Dumbledore had, had on his life. Like he was able to basically communicate with an avatar of Dumbledore or with, you know, what, what uh, knowledge and, and relationship he had with him in this kind of in-between place. I mean, it's pretty meta, right? So really any explanation would work, but that seems to be one of the themes of the book. You know, the people that die are still with us. And in this case, Dumbledore was with him enough to explain some of this stuff. Sounds good to me. Yeah, All I right. don't really care. That about works. Cross. <laughs> Nathan's much more into the wand magic. Okay, so <laughs> Harry dramatically reveals himself to be still alive. And then he, he kind of taunts Voldemort a bit, puts him in his place, and then gets the Expelliarmus for the win. So this was a huge fist pump moment, right? Like this is, this is 10 out of 10 stuff. When he pops out of that invisibility cloak and wins, right? Well, he pops out of the invisibility cloak. Well, even then, he he because Hagrid's carrying him, right? And he just the whole commotion with Neville killing Nagini and Nagini. Harry, yeah, Nagini. However, I mean, you can pronounce it several different ways. Definitely and Nagini. Nagini. I yeah, just heard the Nagini pronunciation before, <laughs> and. I mean, everyone's going, everyone's fighting, right? You got, I mean, Ginny and Molly yeah. fighting Beltrix. I mean, you have... Uh, Neville just uh, goes kamikaze. He just puts himself yeah. out there as a sacrifice. <laughs> yeah, everyone's, yeah. Fighting. everyone's fighting. Everyone's fighting, and then Harry, <laughs> Harry, Harry yeah, pops out, right? <laughs> yeah, well, you have McGonagall and uh, fighting Voldemort. Very, very, I mean serious moment I, it's I like, like i think it's mcgonagall reasons. kingsley and slughorn are all triple dueling yeah. voldemort, right so voldemort voldemort still seems pretty powerful he's able to take on all three just so i don't <laughs> think it's oh. not diminished point. anyway let's we don't need to talk about that one anymore but Nate, well, so naked so when harry when harry to, pops out back yeah. to the yeah so but back to when in part one of this book i said this was my favorite book um just because of the, the, I mean, these moments right here. I mean, everything's happening. I mean, the whole buildup between the whole series. And I just, I just love this. I mean, the whole battle. Sequence. Yeah. Um, I think we ended the last podcast talking of our, about our feelings towards Dobby's death. And we might've been a little unfeeling there. I can't remember all that we said. I was, I was but- unfeeling. Yeah. But I, I was very heartbroken. Where yeah. where do we rank the various deaths that occur in the second half of the book? I guess starting Colin, with Colin Creevy, number one, most heartbreaking. No, <laughs> it, it's got to be Remus and Fred and George. No, it's it's well, actually Colin Creevy. Colin Creevy is a <laughs> is a character that I have a special special place in my heart. Even, I don't what do you mean, Fred and George? Or not? Yeah, also Fred and George didn't both die. (laughs) So a little bit of backstory into my life. Uh, In the year 2013 or 14, a few moons ago, I hosted a Harry Potter murder mystery 
night and i came as colin creedy yeah. and talked Didn't receive in a, the invite yeah sorry about that one but talk, Nathan, talk, did you get an talk, invite i did talked not. in a terrible british accent for two to three hours fantastic oh, party can we, can we hear the british accent? yeah sample needed for the rest of this anecdote so i came in a in a british accent and as colin creevy and it hosted a trivia <laughs> game and it was fantastic we had many people there we had chocolate frogs and and puking pasties and all those fantastic harry potter treats and that's why I love Colin Creevy so much because I was obviously dressed up as Colin Creevy and was the host of the entire night. And so when Colin dies here, it's quite dramatic. It's quite heartbreaking. How many sentences does it get in the book? That was a good accent, by the way, Stephen. Doesn't it just get yeah, one it was, sentence? it was all right. It was probably pretty bad, to be honest. But uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, th- thanks. Yeah, out of 10, hopefully yeah, not out of 100. Better. <laughs> um, I found myself, we could do a whole podcast about this, but the, your attitude towards characters as they're described in the book versus their actor portrayals in the movies. And for Fred and George, there's a pretty big gap between the books and the movies for me. And the movies are awesome. And in the books, they're awesome too. They have a lot of funny moments. Um, side note, I think Harry is really underrated with humor throughout the books is something that I gathered on my most recent reread. He has a lot more funny moments than Fred and George, like little quips mm, here and there okay. and comebacks. But Fred and George are actually kind of cruel at times. And they clearly have some insecurities about how they fit into their tra- the traditional wizarding world. They kind of forge their own path. And like I said, they're a little bit insecure, but also they're kind of cruel at different times to different characters specifically ron like whenever ron does anything his first reaction is always that fred and george are going to get on him about it and not to say that they deserve to die like obviously they didn't deserve to die but just there wasn't enough fred and george moments in the books for me to care that much Mm. when when he died versus in the movie in the movie i cared a lot more is all i'm trying to say so you mostly just were heartbroken because like you love the weasley family but Fred and George themselves are yeah. so like, yeah, you know, had it coming a little bit. It maybe. Was not, I, I don't dislike them, but I'm just, all, that's a long way of saying I like them more in the movies than in the books. But Remus and Remus and Tonks dying, though, that was pretty sad. Yeah. Yeah. Very. I would, that was that would be my top one right there. Remus and Tonks. She didn't kill any big characters in this book. Right? Yeah, I mean, those characters are all, you know, probably, I don't know, C-list characters, if, mm-hmm. if, we had, if we had to rank them. You know, there was no Dumbledore or Sirius death in this one. Yeah, I remember talking about it before the seventh book came out and speculating on if one of the big three could die. Obviously not mm-hmm. Harry, but if Hermione or Ron could have. What about Hagrid? Hey. Hagrid seems like he could have been a good... Hagrid's Hagrid a could list. have. Hagrid's maybe a B-list character. Is and, he just... you know, yeah, he doesn't really do anything else. He, is he, he too... Uh, <laughs> is he too beloved, though? Because I don't know. Like, Hagrid's almost... He's almost like a child, though. In yeah, a lot of ways. Can. If if it's I like... was J.K. Rowling, this isn't going to be a hot take because he kind of... You're going to predict what I was going to say, but... If I was J.K. Rowling, I would have killed Ron. Ron. Yeah, oh my gosh. <laughs> no, just because you hate Ron. If I was J.K. Rowling, I would have killed Hagrid. I think that would have been a gut punch. Wow. The, there is another parallel. Nathan referenced it earlier. When Hagrid carries in Harry, that's a parallel to in book one when he delivers him to Privet Drive. Oh, yeah. That's a good point. Hadn't thought of that. Okay, so the, this is a wrap. Oh, actually, no. Uh, how well? How well did Harry's uh, trash talk to Voldemort land for you? Was that one of the the funny moments for you, Dan? Like he was, he had some nice quips there. He was just, he was just breaking uh, him down. I don't uh, have specific things written down, but it's pretty clear that he like zero percent fears Voldemort. So that's in itself is very impressive, right? I I relate it to to like Spider Man, like the teenage Spider Man when he's fighting the quips that. He, teenage like spider-man says to his villain okay the whole thing's just kind of fun for i i think it's actually pretty different though because spider-man it's more of like this fun thing and 
Uh, and you always know Spider-Man is probably going to, like nothing too bad is going to happen to him. I mean, it, bad things do happen to Spider-Man, but this is a little more dark and serious, well, I would yeah, say, as Harry's but, I mean, the breaking whole down part, this film. Yeah, I mean, like, Harry is called in, calling Voldemort his actual name, Tom Riddle, so you know mm-hmm. he doesn't fear him. He know Harry probably knows that he's gonna win, and so you got it. I mean, he's just telling him how it is, why he's gonna be able to succeed. Yeah, no doubt. Finally, gets to the point where Voldemort just freaks out. Yeah, I think it's a it's it's a really nice moment, and really kind of like shows you know he he is now basically arrived at the potential that Dumbledore saw for him, and kind of treats him the same way Dumbledore does. Okay, so that's a wrap until we no. get to the prologue. No, the it's epilogue, not a wrap. Epilogue. No, it's not a wrap. That's not a wrap. Well, are you saying that we're already going into our character ranking, Stephen? No, no, I'm saying. Oh, on the plot. Yeah, on on the on the Harry, at least on the Harry part, we we're going long because we've got onto some <laughs> tangents, but we'll we'll yeah. hit some <laughs> other characters. But uh, I was going to say into the epilogue, we could talk about the epilogue now, or do we wait until the end of the the pod for that? I think, can't we just talk about the epilogue by saying if we liked the kids' names or not and that they all married each other? Isn't that all, everything that all, all the pundits complain about? I liked the kids' names to respond. <laughs> Nathan, do you like the hey, kids' I, names? I really like, I, I, my favorite name is Scorpio. From Scorpius. From, from Drake, it was Scorpius. Uh-huh, yeah. Scorpius, Thanks yeah. for the correction there. And then... um. I, I I just felt like Harry's kids had too many names. Just just yeah. the middle the middle name. Middle too many names. too many power names. Too many names yeah. being reused. Too many too many power names there. Uh-huh. I forget. Do they actually address them by their first and middle name? Does he say like, well, "Hey, yeah, Albus James Severus"? Sirius. Yeah. No, they just call him James and Lily. And uh, what do they call out? Al- Al- Albus. No, no Albus. No, because Harry, his um. One of his kids is nervous about going to Hogwarts. Well, yeah, he says Albus Severus Potter. You know, yeah, you're named Albus after the two Severus greatest headmen. Yeah. Well, I thought that those names were great. It showed no. the, the appreciation that Harry. No, totally. It wraps up Snape's plot arc because it shows that Harry is now accepting what Snape was. You know, he he calls him one of the greatest headmasters of Hogwarts. Yeah, but I don't know. Maybe just more kids or. Because more kids more kids Such a power complaint name. more kids is the complaint <laughs> Wait, what, no, what names were you no, wanting just instead of like albus uh, severus maybe just albus and then just a regular middle name and nah, albus, nah I, two, I, I, I like the name power name the name the names are great i think or one thing james of... <laughs> james severus or james albus no nah, no you got you got to tie the headmasters together for that for that uh, great line there, the two greatest headmasters of Hogwarts. I think it's just nice to see Harry finally has the family that he's wanted the whole time, right? Like his scar hasn't hurt for 19 years, all is well, end of the book. Great. I think that Harry should have ended up with Cho. Thoughts on this opinion? No, bad opinion. Probably the worst opinion or we've had. Cho, Cho never does anything wrong for any of the books. I stand by that. And you Cho's get this petty worst. little moment whenever they're assigning roles for seeking out the diadem and everyone's hyped up in um, in the room of requirement. And Cho volunteers to escort Harry to Ravenclaw house and Ginny gets all jealous. It's like, it's not Ginny's best look, but. Um, no, Dan, I, that's worse than my <laughs> take that Harry and Hermione should be together. Yeah. The Cho take, the Cho take is bad. Cho, <laughs> Cho's book five performance. Yeah, there's no redemption there. Okay, let's talk about uh, let's talk about Ron and Hermione. We're we're way over on time, so we do kind of have to cut these other character conversations short. Yeah. So, uh, what was your top Ron moment? Top Ron moment. Um, yeah. The end of the book, the that last page. Um, there when there's nothing on the page. I don't have okay. any top Ron. <laughs> Dan. <laughs> Ron did. Ron did some good things here. So that I know. No, actually, okay. Besides that, I I did like Ron. It was Ron's idea to go to the Chamber of Secrets. Yeah, and he and he uses the, uh, somehow he's able to use Parcel Tongue. Also, plot armor. Like, oh, we need this thing to open. Well, oh, Ron can do it now. Well, huh. it explains. Okay, it. Harry talks in his sleep. 
Well, that, that's an explanation, but there's no real reason to think that I could actually let you learn parcel tongue. Yeah, I, I don't know. But that was a nice moment that he actually thought of. And then as well, when they're using the Marauder's map and Harry disappears, and it was Ron was like, well, he, he's in the room with requirement. Sure. Yeah, yeah Ron. Yeah. Those are my top Ron moments. Ron also able to overcome his fear of the giant spiders. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. I have more Ron moments. I have, he, uh, so something I, that I think is underrated about Ron is he's not scared to apparate after his splinching experience. I would think that you would have some PTSD with that. Oh yeah. Especially the type of spell where you have to be totally focused and confident in order to execute it perfectly. Or So props to him for that. And then there's a moment when Harry is a really underwhelming hero um, when he first arrives at Hogwarts, he's probably just really tired, honestly. Like, I'll give him a little bit of a, sure. of a break. And he has a similar kind of failed moment when they're in the head and he's trying to recruit people to Dumbledore's army. But everyone's there, ready to hear a rousing speech. Obviously, Harry can't tell them what they want to hear, but he can at least, like, not try to be a total rain cloud on their enthusiasm. But Ron wow. is the one that kind of prods him and reminds him... Um, kind of gives him the cue to to give a speech kind of thing so that was a strong moment from ron nice okay so more moments than nathan's end of the book i hate ron uh, yeah. how about how about hermione what were some of hermione's top moments hermione i don't have hardly anything in this she has a whole thing where she's kind of battling being a mudblood and Bellatrix attacks her supposedly because she's a mudblood. Well, I guess that's in the first part of the book. Uh -huh. But other than that, she she falls in love with Ron officially and they have their kiss. But it's just because he says that he wants to go and free the house elves. That's all yeah. that he had to do to win her affection. Yeah, Hermione's still on it's the SPEW train for some reason. What about uh, her infiltration of Gringotts and disguised as Bellatrix? That was pretty good, especially when, you know, Travers, the other Death Eater comes in. That wasn't part of the plan. She's able to play it All off right. cool. I mean, she does. We already kind of talked the Imperius curse to death, but she's able to make it work. She, she gets them through that stressful moment. Yeah. Yeah, just compared, I wasn't as impressed with that as her my, previous feats. My top yeah. Hermione yeah. moment is when... Harry, I mean, Hermione also finds out that Harry is a horcrux somehow, which doesn't make any sense that she would find out. Um, like when she when she's suspecting that Harry's going to go sacrifice himself or what? Yeah, yeah. Does she know that or does she just think that because Voldemort said you have one hour to give me Harry Potter? Well, no, I think she knows that. Not sure about you're... that. Can't not sure about that but, but i do think yeah, she we, knows we probably don't have time to debate that i'm not sure about that so we'll have to throw that over to to reddit and discord but uh that that was your moment for hermione yeah just because she's i mean just the smartness that she's able to f figure that out without the knowledge that harry now knows from the pencil. okay still questioning if she is actually able to figure it out but we'll move on let's talk about snape because uh, Snape is obviously very controversial. So should we just start with the thing? Like, is it creepy that he loved Lily and that was why everything, like that was his whole life? Essentially, is that creepy yes, or is very, that- very creepy. Nathan's on the very- I don't think it was. I just think he was an unattractive dude that wasn't charismatic. And this was the one girl that gave him attention. They were best friends. And it's really hard to get over something like that and try like to settle eight, for I something mean, else because Lily's like a 10. Years later. He has nothing else going for him, right? Like there's probably no one else, like unless you get some random, like Draco is able to, who does Draco end up with? Like Millicent Bolstrove or something? What, what's that character? Oh yeah, isn't that Penelope Clearwater? No. No, it's not. <laughs> Wait, hold on. I need to look this up. I'm, I'm forgetting. Yeah, Draco is able to find love. You think Siri, you think Snape might be able to find love somewhere, uh -huh. never does, but also like there's a lot going on with this dude. Like he's obviously pretty brilliant, but also comes from, uh, you know, some, some, 
uh, a little bit of a bad background and is unable to ever kind of cast off the allure and the history of Slytherin and the dark arts. He's a pretty tragic character. It's Astoria Greengrass, by the way. And Stephen, I agree with you. That's who Draco marries. Just who is this? Some random character? It says it's a younger sister of a Slytherin. But okay. I can't remember anyone with the last name Greengrass. I just can't. Okay. I, I could never get to the point where I could forgive Snape for how cruel he was to everyone. Um, not only Harry, but like especially Neville or characters like that. There's no reason for that. Yeah. I do think the whole stalker thing after reading the books, I think that's more of something that's derived from fan fiction. Because it does say that he was hiding in the bushes that one time when he was a kid. But it's not that creepy. Um, like, like I said, he just had a connection with Lily that he didn't have with anyone else and they were good friends. So, um, it's not like he stalked her when they were married or anything. It doesn't say anything. Yeah. He never tries to like duel James for her honor or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that's true. I I don't know. Nathan, I'm not done with my Snape thoughts. Oh, I'm more Snape thought (laughs) my, uh, Snape monologue. But what bugs me about Snape too, is that I didn't realize that he chose the dark arts way before Lily rejected him. That's like part of the reason why she rejected Uh him. And I get it. He was in Slytherin. He didn't really have anybody else to hang out with. So probably a lot of it rubbed off on him. But that was a choice that he made that he didn't have to, that maybe Lily would have accepted him otherwise. And I don't ever feel like he really grows to appreciate Harry or really evolves as a character. I think he just still sees him as James's son, the whole time because at the end when he says always like that's the only reason why he's doing this is for lily Uh and i don't know he just retroactively kind of applies all of james's weaknesses to harry and that just seems really weird to me and it's really sad and he's just trapped in the sad state so it just it's compounding because he's like i love lily i've got to save her son that's the thing i'm doing but the, the person I'm doing this, like the reason I'm basically still living, like my motivation is actually the person that I hate the most because it's, you know, James's son and he's way too much like James and I hate this kid's guts. And now I hate myself because this is what my whole life is. Uh, yeah. It's a pretty pathetic and sad existence. N- yeah. Nathan, what were you going to say? Oh, I mean, I just feel like part of it as well is that he, after he learns that Voldemort's gonna kill Lily and well that he killed Lily and everything like that he and he goes and Dumbledore is like well pledge your allegiance to me and 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 we'll defeat the Dark Lord and everything like that I just feel like Snape is just like kind of weak like he doesn't he should have have stayed a Death Eater you agree with Bellatrix no, no, nothing like that. Just like go off by himself or something. Like, why does he have yeah. to stay? Go on like, vacation. No, just like go live somewhere else. Like, create he's a got, new life. I mean, that takes a yeah. lot, right? Like, he's got some ties still to the. I. But what I ties does he I, have? He could Lily's open up a dead. potion. He could open up a sick potion shop with all, all of his concoctions. Like. His yeah, he could have gone other paths, but uh, he he didn't. I mean, that that's kind of the story, right? Also, on a side note, pretty the, believable. The uh, the actor that played Snape was the only one that knew that Snape was actually good. I think I've heard that before. Didn't he? He what? and he passed away this year or the year before. Yeah, not that long ago. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. I think uh, I think we're ready to go into our top three and bottom three well, character well, rankings. Well, no, I have we're more, not going to talk about takes. Neville. <laughs> Those can be discussed. Those can be discussed in your no. character rankings. I have I have something that I need to bring up that I was proud of myself for thinking of, but the whole the Ariana thing. So we didn't talk about that, and uh, I I was just wondering if you guys knew. It seems that. The only solution being to lock her up basically for her entire life, it doesn't seem believable to me. Like there had to be something else that could be done. And I was just wondering if it all stemmed from this one situation with the cruel muggle boys that had given her this whatever complex she had. Couldn't they have just cast Obliviate on her and gotten rid of that memory? 
Boom. That's the best take you've ever heard right there. Could have solved a lot of issues. Well, Damn, I've already heard that take. Can you just do oh, dang it to so any like any mental illness or or uh, mental issues are going to be solved by using Obliviate on someone? Well, only in very severe cases like this. Hmm. Like if if you can't even take her out, like what kind of existence is that that no one is allowed to know that she's there and she's not a, ever allowed to leave the house? I think it's worth it in that case. I don't think Obliviate itself. I mean, maybe there's some other. You know, maybe there are some uh, wizard psychiatrist specialists, you know, some yeah, branch uh, of, of, of mental magic. It doesn't There doesn't appear to be that. Mental that magic. much is clear. Yeah. I mean, we saw a powerful Obliviate used on Lockhart and the dude lost his mind entirely. So I think there is some danger there. All right, that's it. Nathan, what were you going to say about Neville? Or are you, is he in your top or bottom three? Yeah, I think <laughs> you guys, you guys have to condense the remainder of your takes <laughs> into the top and bottom three all right okay. that's what's gonna happen so this is our our last top and bottom three for harry potter at least until we figure out a new way to do harry potter for future episodes but we're going to talk about performances for characters in deathly hollows part two only so nothing else and uh, we're starting with our top three characters so it sounds like nathan's ready to go yeah i'm ready to go so number number three is uh is going to be uh oh man yeah it seems like you're ready to go <laughs> i know who my top two are okay yeah. um number three is gonna be uh i'm gonna say mcgonagall uh just because she i mean she cast a spell to bring the like the guards the the stone guards out and didn't seem I mean, like she held the school together very well though well, well, I mean, yeah. it was a hard position to be in. Everything's coming in a very yeah. hard position to be in. Sure. I mean, a very hard year to be in since she's under Snape. She can't really do anything. I mean, she has to protect the kids somewhat. Um. Yeah, we didn't. We didn't. Like... We didn't have you know enough insight into what was actually happening. Yeah. Maybe to to fully judge that. Okay, that's fair, McGonagall put her down uh okay this may be controversy but number two is going to be harry okay, okay. yeah i mean um, harry harry potter main character well i i just feel like harry just would like... be number one but okay. number two harry i mean he defeated voldemort um sure. <laughs> number one is neville yeah neville yeah saw that coming yeah we didn't talk about neville out. we didn't talk about neville at all yeah, breaks breaks the binding charm, takes the sword out of that flaming cat, and kills Nagini. Just full out. Go just, for it. Yeah, just Neville, my man. Yeah, for sure. It's also Neville. So is 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 the uh, everyone loves Neville, right? Like this is not an opinion that uh, is being voiced for the first time. No. How much of that is? I mean, he's great in the book. Like it's nice to see this character who went from in book one receiving 10 house points for being pathetic and being the recipient of Hermione's curse on him or Jinx for, to being the, the hero, right? A yeah. hero of part in, in book seven, right? A very courageous moment. Also, shows why also he leads the Dumbledore's army. Yeah, yeah. He's been, he's been doing good stuff for the year. How much of that was because of the events that I just talked about in the book and how much of it was because of the actor's huge glow up between, you know, as, as the movies went on, right? I think it's the but, book. The book, the movies are based off the book. Well, yeah, I know, but the like the physical appearance of the actor, because well, he's could have gone. He's a, like J.K. Rowling could have gone a different route with it for sure. Well, I, well, I know, but <laughs> I'm just saying people really kind of like him because he's really like he's hot by the end of the movie oh, series right oh, like that no i feel like it's more of i mean just his character how his character growth was i mean he could have even if he didn't like grow up and how he what is now or was when the movies were i feel like it's more of his character growth and how it took place over all seven books sure. i do th i think that it plays a part in it Stephen, for sure like for example people love neville out of the secondary characters he's 
one of the most mentioned like think of him like compared to luna is he necessarily yeah. that much cooler than luna i guess he yeah. does have the moment with the snake and he does do more courageous things but luna is also really cool but i i think that his physical appearance has a lot to do with it but it's cool how it worked out like that like you have the the character glow up with the appearance glow up like uh -huh. simultaneous uh -huh. also i mean harry i mean neville if it wasn't if it weren't going to be harry it was going to be neville to be the chosen one i mean sure. yeah there's that neville's, whole angle neville's background isn't the best i mean out there i mean his parents are in the hospital lives with his grandma so i mean it's not like he yeah. has the best background yeah there, there's a lot of parallels there's a lot of parallels throughout the series okay dan what is your top three i'm finalizing my list right now and man some tough choices i know for a fact that Ron is going to be on the top three. For I'm I'm going to put Harry at number one. So yeah. let's have Harry one, sure. then Ron. Let's have Ron's either two or three. I'll decide whenever I I find the other character. We already talked about Ron for a while. Don't need to go into it further. Probably Neville is going to be my third, actually, just because I don't think it could be understated what he had to go through for the entire year, and he really mastered that principle of. Uh, I guess you would call what's the word for it with like social justice, like silent, not silent rebellion, but like nonviolent protests, I guess you could call it. Okay. Like he was, he was exploring really creative routes to not necessarily be compliant with what was going on at the school without also completely endangering himself, his family or friends. And I thought he towed that really well. Um, also, I, the parallels between him and Harry, I think it's cool that J.K. Rowling let him, as kind of the alternate chosen one, he got to be the one to get rid of the last Horcrux. Was was a nice touch. Yeah. Okay, my top three in no specific order are Harry, Dumbledore, and Snape. Which, which Dumbledore? Oh. Albus Dumbledore. <laughs> <Which>? <laughs> Albus Dumbledore. Aberforth is cool, right? Yeah, he's all right. So okay. Harry, <laughs> Harry, Albus Dumbledore, and Snape. And these are three very different characters. They play very different roles. They all do some huge things. They all have some shortcomings. But overall, I think these are the three heroes of the victory, right? They, they all play significant, the most significant roles, I think, in defeating Voldemort. And so they are my top three. Okay, let's go to bottom three. Nathan, who did you hate? Um, Ron, so number one. Who else? Number one is a uh, no. It's not Ron. Ron actually was number four in my top three. Oh, interesting. I, okay. Yeah. Honorable he, mention. He almost made it on there. Yeah, honorable mention. Uh, number one, my bottom three is gonna be Voldemort. Um. Yeah. I felt like he could have done so much more. I mean, he had Harry supposedly dead, right? And he sends Narcissa Malfoy to go check on him, and she says he's dead just because. Draco's alive. Yeah, he I mean, was tricked a lot. Sell, why not send like Bellatrix, your most trusted Death Eater, or someone else like that? Um, also, just the fact that he couldn't beat a seventeen-year-old. Uh, and then number two, ah oh, man, so many, so many different options. Uh, the number two is probably going to be Bellatrix. Um. So just characters that were killed. No, no, not necessarily. <laughs> um, Bellatrix yeah, Bellatrix just, finally gets owned. Yeah, yeah, gets owned by one of the coolest see uh, like scenes ever. Molly Weasley just goes ham, just because she swears. No, well, no, yeah. but <laughs> but like she, you never see Molly Weasley like, just like. Yeah, it was a cool scene. It was tough, yeah. like that. I mean, yeah, Mo Molly house, Weasley un magic, unleashed stuff like that, but uh -huh. Molly Weasley unleashed. Um, and then number three is going to be, it's going to be Remus. I just felt like he shouldn't have died. So it is another like, character that dies. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I could have put another person in there, but just now thinking about it, I mean, Remus or Tonks. I mean, you just had your kid, like. I get it. Like you're battling for the fate of like the world, but at the should, same time, should have done better. Should shouldn't have died. Do, should do have been better a better fighting. Wizard. Do better <laughs> fighting, or just like stay home with your kid, 
or at or least just, one just of sit them. it out. <laughs> one of them stay home, either Tonks or Remus. Irresponsible parenting. Irresponsible yeah. parenting lands you on Nathan's bottom three. All right, Dan, what were your bottom three? Okay, um, Voldemort number one. He should have took better care of his Horcruxes. I do have a note. His announcing system is kind of cool. Let's go. Let's go ahead and give a third Wonder Woman reference there. That um, the Wonder Woman guy could have used Voldemort's announcing, like infiltrating the airwaves in everyone's minds. Ah, okay. power. Yep. Yep. Uh, number two is Bellatrix. Like, how does she get owned by Molly Weasley? I do have a little tidbit of history that I learned about Bellatrix. So the three sisters, Narcissa, Andromeda, and Bellatrix, they're based off of the Mitford sisters of the early 20th century. So one was a diehard Hitler supporter. That would be like Bellatrix. One had a husband in the Communist Party, but later kind of had mixed feelings about it. And that would be like Narcissa. And then the other totally abandoned her family and went to the U.S. and left the Communist Party. And that would be like Andromeda. Some background there. Who is Andromeda? Oh. That's Tonks. Tonks. Mom. Oh, okay. Okay. It's his mom. Okay. No, it's it's Nefedor's mom. Right. Yeah. So First name, yeah. And then third, I have Hermione for ending up with Ron out of all the eligible wizards out there. <laughs> So you hate Victor Crumb you, and you hate Ron too. Dan's finally outed. He's on Nathan's yes, side. Ron. Dan, join <laughs> the party. Come to the light side, Dan. Yeah, I get it. You had a lot of adventures together, but and I know the Wizarding World is small in Europe. Just ex- hey, explore around how, a little bit. So to go back to my previous point, how much of that hatred is because Ron did not glow up in the movies? His, his actor. <laughs> This actor, unfortunately, <laughs> did not. We think Hermione yeah, this is this is just a Neville. this is totally just an Emma Watson Rupert Grint take. Yeah, is that is that all it is? Sorry, Rupert. No. I mean, like it, it might be a, her, yeah, like Hermione should have ended up with Neville. Is that what you're saying? I, yeah, yeah, I I mean, agreed. Yeah, like like hot celebrities, you know they're. The ten, tens end up with tens. That's that's what we're familiar with. Yeah, but I mean, J.K. Rowling didn't write the book based off the characters. Like, don't tell me she wasn't movies. thinking about it. She had to have been thinking about it a little bit in this snake chopping off head procedure. Oh like, yeah. Oh dang. Yeah. I haven't seen Neville in a year. Yeah, he's Wait, really. What's up, wow. Bottom. He's really chopping through that that water. whole head in one <laughs> swing. <laughs> yeah. All right. This is the time of the podcast where I come up with my bottom three on the fly. One of my bottom three, I think we've actually done this before, but I'm going to do it again, is all of Slytherin house because the whole house just leaves the school, like every single, to a man and woman, they leave and, and not, not one. Yeah. That had to be for Hogwarts. We forgot to mention that. Embarrassing. And honestly, (laughs) I don't love that plot decision because people struggle with Slytherin House. They're like, oh, they're all evil. There's, you know, Slytherin House has got some good qualities, but because of things like this that J.K. Rowling wrote in there, people are confused and they just think Slytherins are pure evil. So I think that was maybe a missed opportunity. Slytherin House, bottom three. I'm going to throw Aberforth in there. So Ooh. sorry, Dan, because I know you Ooh. were maybe, sounds like you're maybe putting him in the, in the top three. I just think he's kind of kind of a wimp, you know. He tries to talk Harry out of, tries to to talk Harry out of it uh, entirely, and uh, does not display really any courage at all. I mean, he is able to get the rescue. The rescue was was key, but uh, I'm I'm a little disappointed by by Aberforth. I mean, from the details we knew at that point, I think I think he's a rational thinker. I think the chances of them succeeding was very low. So. I don't think it's the worst take to say to like that. And it seems like he helped out Neville and Dumbledore's army a lot throughout the, the school year. Yeah. I'm not into and... the, the rational thinking during moments <laughs> like this. I'd, I'd rather have the more heroic characters who are able to go out there and get things done rather than the guys who are like, oh, we got to like negotiate and bargain. Like that's boring. No, we, we got to go save the day. Not, not into that. Fair enough. It's kind of like the 
kind of like Kaladin's father, Liren. In a oh, that does remind me of. Yeah, of don't me. even. Yeah, yeah Dan, <laughs> how does that remind you? All right, and my number one bottom three. It's hard to say it's not Voldemort, right? So that that's who it's going to be. The guy blows it and he dies. I, that, I mean, that's the plot line of, of Voldemort. He makes a lot of mistakes. I think his biggest one was c- continuing to uh, not be aware of Harry looking into his mind and basically giving him the playbook. That That's a mistake. And that's probably why he lost. Um, real quick, I we haven't mentioned them at all, but f- coming in fourth on my list was the Malfoy family. Because top I'm or, not... In- top or bottom? Bottom, sorry. Bottom f- yeah. four. Because, yeah, I, they're... I, congratulations you're loyal to your family that's cute and stuff but they still don't dis- they don't appear to possess a lot of moral fiber um not not impressed with them it's seem a little impressed. spineless yeah i can see that yeah, yeah up until the hey. end where uh, you know draco draco never really you know him and harry have a little bit of a maybe a respect or acknowledgement of each other in the epilogue but uh, never really has like a, you know, a, a redemption moment per se. Yeah. I, th- I think the one, or there's a couple of mistakes J.K. Rowling makes, but I think the one of the mistakes is going 19 years into the future. I feel like she could have written a whole lot more books or <laughs> just a lot more stories if she went like one or two years. Or maybe this like is, five no, years this, this is just a, this is just a take where you, you, you want more Harry Potter. This yeah is, yeah this I is mean, the take. <laughs> at the time you'd want more harry potter when you first read the books i mean even if like for 12 13 year olds you want more harry potter hey there's fan fiction out there yeah and the there's fan fiction of... fan yeah. fiction available sounds like you've read some well i've seen some yeah yeah and with harry and hermione <laughs> <laughs> alternate <laughs> alternative history for nathan all right any more uh, final takes here before we close Dude, out our coverage of the books i'm just way bummed that that was our last bottom three top three rundown we'll have to do a tier list we could do we could do a lot with tier lists tier lists are really fun right now Phantology's done a few so we could do characters we could do locations we could do i mean books although there's only seven of them we could do magical artifacts spells there's a lot we could do. I think tier list is going to be our next Harry Potter episode. Okay. Okay. Yeah, way excited. All right. And if you want to see, you listeners, that is, if you want to see more Harry Potter coverage, just let us know. You can join our Discord. Invites are going to be on uh, episode links on social media. And if you want to see more from Phantology, you can find that at www.phantologybooks.com. And then finally, you can support the show at patreon.com slash phantology underscore books all right all right muggles see you guys later i just want you to know that if the phantology podcast died i devote the rest of my entire life no matter how miserable it made me to protecting its offspring thank you severus (laughs) that's that's all i could come up with (laughs) it wasn't bad it wasn't bad although i don't like the insinuation that phantology podcast would ever die all right see you guys later yeah okay peace